Welcome back to Business Analytics for Decision Makers. Today we're going to cover linear regression and causal models. Earlier in this block, we covered time series models. And we covered moving average models first, then weighted moving average models, and finally exponential smoothing. Once we had these models, we developed for what forecast error was and then metrics by which to compare different forecasting models. We covered mean absolute deviation, MAD, mean squared error, MSC, and mean absolute percent error, MATE, for comparing the models. Using the metrics, we were then able to select which one of our forecasting models was most likely to make a good prediction for the future. In this lesson, we're going to introduce linear regression. And we're going to start this discussion by identifying what a dependent and independent variables are. Once we've done the simple linear regression case, we're going to expand it to do multiple linear regression when we have numerous independent variables. After that, we're going to cover the outputs of linear regression models. And the outputs that we're going to look at, because there's a lot, are multiple R, R squared, adjusted R squared, the F test, the model coefficients, the T test, and confidence intervals. And don't be worried by the number of names there. We're going to go through each one at a time and make you comfortable with them. The final thing we're going to cover today is making a forecast with those linear regression models we developed. So what is linear regression? Well, it's when we make a forecast and we say there's an added relationship between the dependent and independent variable. What's a dependent variable? Well, it's determined by an independent, i.e. the other variables in the model. Whereas an independent variable, its value does not depend on other variables. So if I have a home and I'm thinking about putting it up for sale and I want to estimate that sale price, that would be my dependent variable is the house's sale price. And what I think would influence it maybe is my home square footage. Right, so it's that directional relationship. So let's talk about linear regression visually. So it's that added relationship we're trying to fit. And so for our home, let's think of that. Our home price is then equal to some intercept, some baseline home price, plus the slope times my home square footage. So maybe I can go out and I can collect a whole bunch of different home sales prices, which I've put on my y-axis, my vertical axis. And along the horizontal axis, I could plot the square footage of those homes. And we can see somewhat of a linear trend between the sale price and the square footage of the home. And so what we need to do is figure out the intercept and slope for that equation. So it'll take on the form where y equals beta naught plus beta 1 x, right? Where the intercept is beta naught and the slope is beta 1. And it's our job to pick that beta naught and beta 1. So for example, if home price is equal to 40,000 plus 0 0.1 times the square footage, if I were to plot that, right, I picked an intercept and a slope. I would get this line through the data. And that may be a very accurate predictor of our home sale price. So how do we pick that intercept and the slope? So for our example where home price is equal to intercept plus the slope times square footage, right, a task is picking that and that can be tri tr tricky. The intercept is going to move the line vertically. So that beta naught is going to adjust it up and down. So if beta naught increases, the line shifts up. If beta naught decreases, the line will shift down. What does the slope do? Well, the slope changes the angle of the line. So if beta 1 increases our slope, the line becomes steeper. If beta 1 decreases, it becomes flatter. If beta 1 is 0, the line's flat, which means there's no real relationship between our independent and dependent variable. And then finally, if beta 1 is negative, the line slopes down. What does a computer do? How does it pick the intercept and slope? Well, it selects the slope and intercept to minimize the model's mean squared error for the, for the data by which it's fit on. So let's compute this in Excel. If you download and open the Excel Lesson 8 file, you will get a worksheet that is identical to this. You can go ahead and click on the linear regression tab. And when you get to the linear regression tab, we're going to have to choose our intercept and our slope. So let's go ahead and start with the 
intercept of 40 and a slope of 0.1 that we used in our earlier example. And so our forecast in this case is the intercept, which never changes, so we can go ahead and lock it with dollar signs, plus the slope. Again, we can lock it because that never changes times a home square footage, which will change with each home. And we get our forecast. So our forecasted home sale for the first house, which was 1,510 square feet, was 191,000, and it actually sold for 182.5. So our error in this case would be our actual minus our forecast. So we're off by 8,500. Our squared error is just equal to the error squared. And so I've got all this information. I like to fit it for my first 12 homes. So I can go ahead and just drag it down. My forecast for home 11 would be the intercept plus 0.1 times 1,750 square feet. And so we predicted it sell for 215,000 and it sold for 177. Our mean squared error is the average of these guys, our squared errors. So now we've got our mean squared error computed. If we zoom out, you can see that the chart that we showed is also displayed here. And so if I were to change the intercept, you'll see that the prediction line, the red line, will shift up. Similarly, if I make the intercept lower, that prediction line shifts down, whereas its slope stays the exact same. I can change the slope, and we'll notice that the line becomes steeper. Similarly, if I decrease the slope, and make it negative, it'll turn upside down, it'll go all the way flat. Zero, it'll just become a flat line at 40, the intercept. So let's go ahead and make it 0.1, because that seems to fit our data quite well. So I can tell the computer to fit the slope already. A lot of you may be familiar with this. So if I click on the data points, and then I right click, I can say add trend line. In this case, it's linear regression that we're doing, so it's a linear trend line. And let's display the equation so we can compare it to what we have. So let's go ahead and hit close. We've got our equation. Let's move it out of the way a little. And you can see that my linear trend line and my forecast are really close together. Now, how did the model do this? Well, it minimized the mean squared error. We know how to minimize the mean squared error. So we can click on solver. And we can go ahead and set the mean squared error to a minimum by allowing the computer to pick our intercept and our slope. We don't have any constraints, and our intercept and slope can be non-negative, so we want this box unchecked. And then we can go ahead and click Solve, and we see that our intercept, 41, 41.1, they're the same, our slope, 0 0.978, 0 0.978. So now you know where, how the computer is solving when it's doing a linear regression. So that's our simple linear model. Now what happens if I want to look at other factors behind just square footage simultaneously when making that home sale prediction? Multiple linear regression is when we estimate an additive relationship between the dependent variable and multiple independent variables simultaneously. So for example, let's go back to our home and I want to predict my sale price. Square footage is one factor that can influence it. The number of bathrooms is another that could influence it. And for those of you that had kids, you realize that what school district your schools are in, maybe there's a preferable school district in your city, can also influence your home sale price. So now we're going to estimate home price as that intercept beta naught plus a beta one times the square footage plus a slope times the number of bathrooms plus a beta three times the school district. So how do we do this in Excel? So if you go back to this Lessons Excel file, we were on the Linear Regression tab. Let's move to the Multiple Linear Regression tab. So now I have home sales data for those 12 houses. I have their square footage, but I've also collected the number of bathrooms each house had and whether or not they were in a preferred school district. So I can't visualize this anymore. We're now in four-dimensional space. And in order to do this, what we're going to have to use is data analysis. And under data analysis, there's this tool, Regression. When you select it, you're going to get this GUI that pops up, and we're going to pick our Y range or dependent variable, in which case it's our home sale price, and then our independent variables are square foot, bathrooms, and district. 
I can go ahead and say I have labels because I do and then I'm going to output it within this worksheet and so I'm going to select just row G near the top to output it and I'm going to go ahead and hit OK and it's already gone and it fit a model for us. We can space things out so we can read what it's saying and we have all this information that's shown how do we interpret it. So let's go back and discuss all of these different factors from the summary output and look at them in more depth. So let's take a closer look at the regression outputs. The first output we typically look at is multiple R, and this is the correlation between the dependent variable and the independent variable or variables. It's located right at the top of our regression, and it's the correlation coefficient. So a positive value here means that both the dependent and independent variable move in the same direction at the same time. Whereas if it's negative, it means that as the one increases, the other decreases or vice versa. So they're moving in opposite directions. After multiple R, we typically look at R squared, which is located right below. And R squared tells us the percent of variation in the dependent variable explained by the independent variables. All right, so it's located right below the multiple R in Excel. And we would read it as 91.7% of variation in home prices is explained by square footage, number of bathrooms in school district. So the independent variables in our model. After R squared, we look at adjusted R squared. And this is typically what we talk about when we do R squared. And the reason why is the addition of independent variables will always increase a model's R squared. Adjusted R squared responds to whether or not the included variable is significant. So it's located right below R squared, and we would read it as 88.6% of the variation in home price is explained by our independent variables in the model. Good practice, always use adjusted R squared when reporting the R squared value. So the F test is what we look at next, and what the F test answers is whether we have found a statistically significant model relationship. So is one of our independent variables related to our dependent variable? So it analyzes the null hypothesis that our y variable is unrelated to our x's and compares it to the alternative hypothesis that the y is related to at least one of our independent variables, one of our x's. Where do we look to do this test? Well, we look under the ANOVA table and to the far right, we look at the significance f value. So go ahead and keep that 0.00011 number in your head. And so significance f is the probability that null hypothesis is true. So in this case, there is a 0.011% chance home price is unrelated to square footage, bathrooms, and school district, given our model data on the 12 houses. Typically, we pick a significance level alpha, which is our cutoff for rejecting the null hypothesis and accepting the alternative that our model is significant. Common significance levels are 10%, 5%, 1%, and 0.1%. In this case, any of those significance levels, our significance F value is substantially smaller. So we would reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative, that in this case, we've produced a significant model. After that, we look at coefficients. And coefficients tell us what a one unit change in an independent variable's effect will be on the dependent variable. So the coefficients are in the bottom table in the outputs and located far to the left. The first coefficient we typically look at is the intercept. And it's basically saying that the average starting price of a house is 75.1,000. After the intercept, we can look at our actual independent variables. So square footage in this case, we're saying one square foot adds $40 to a home value as estimated by our model. Alternatively, 100 square feet adds $4,000 to a home's value. Each full bathroom that a house has adds $31.2,000 to a home's value. Alternatively, if you're comparing two houses that are almost identical, except for one has one less bathroom, you'd expect that to reduce the home's value by $31.2,000. Being in the preferred school district for where we estimated our model adds $25.3,000 to a home's value. Right, so that's our last variable. So after that, we look at the t-test. And a t-test measures whether an independent variable's relationship with the dependent variable's significance. And so what this really tells us is whether or not the independent variables that we've looked at should be included in the model. And they're located 
underneath the p-value is where we want to look to do our t-test. So let's consider a significance level of 10%. What we're going to do is we're going to look at that p-value and we want to see that it should be less than 0.1, the significance level we chose for our cutoff. And if it's less than 1, we're good. So we're going to look at each variable. Square footage is less, so it should be included. Bathrooms is less, so it should be included. And school district is less, so it should be included. So we've got a good model if we're our significance level that we want to make our cutoff at is 10%. What about if our significance level was 5%? Well, in that case, the intercept's not significant. That's not really a problem, which is fortunate because it's structurally included in our model. It's something that we don't actually remove. Now, square footage is not less than 0.5%, so that's a problem. That variable shouldn't be included in our model anymore. Bathrooms is less than that 5%, so it should be included. And school district is less than 5%, is not less than 5%, so that's a problem as well. So we've got two variables that it looks like we need to remove from our model. So if a, a variable fails the t-test, we have to do some more model development. So the intercept can fail the t-test and we'll keep it because it's structurally in the model equation. It's that beta naught. And what this implies when it fails is that it's not statistically different than zero. There are special types of linear regression models where you force the intercept to be zero, but those are fairly uncommon. If a variable fails the t-test at our chosen significance level, we must rerun the model. And when we do this, we drop the least significant variable first. So we don't just drop all of the non-significant variables at once. Typically, we do one variable at a time because two variables may be insignificant due to collinearity. And collinearity is when variables move in the same direction at the same time or move in counter directions in equivalent ratios at the same time. And when this happens, the variables have the same explanatory power. So often dropping one will make the other ins make the other significant. So confidence intervals are the final output that we typically look at, and it's the estimated range with a x percent confidence of where the relationship between the dependent and independent variables lie. So the, it's located at the bottom right of our table, and for the intercept, we're 95 percent confidence that our estimated intercept relationship is between negative 8,000 and 158,000. For square footage, we're not sure if it has a positive or negative relationship, so it includes zero. So with 95% confidence, we aren't ready to say that square footage has an effect on home sales price. Bathrooms is from 14,000 to 47,000, so we're 95% confidence that bathrooms are having a positive effect on home sales price. So more bathrooms is increasing a home's final price. School district, again, it includes zero, so we're not quite certain that it's having an effect on our home sales price with 95% confidence. 95% confidence ranges are the default, but we'll often look at other bands. So sometimes we'll look at narrower ones, such as 80 or 90% confidence, but sometimes we'll look at wider confidence intervals as well, so 99 or 99.9%. .9%. How do we make a forecast? Well, we're going to take the coefficient values uh, multiply them by our independent variable data for that to make the forecast. So once we're happy with our model, right, we want to be able to project and use that model to estimate what homes are going to sell for. So in our case, a home sale is equal to that intercept value plus beta 1 times square footage plus beta 2 times bathrooms plus beta 3 times school district. And where are we going to get those betas from? Well, they're just our coefficients that we've already found, right? So our intercept is that beta naught. The 0.04 is our square footage slope, 31.2 is our bathroom slope, and that 25.3 is our estimated school district effect. So if we wanted to predict for a home that has 2,480 square feet, three bathrooms, and is in the preferred school district, we would put that data in to our model, and we'd solve this equation, and we'd forecast that the home's going to sell for 294,000. So let's go ahead and do a second home. This home's a little bit smaller. It's only 1,800 square feet with 1.75 baths, and it's not in the preferred school district. So if we solve this mathematics, we come up to the fact that this house is probably only going to sell for about 127,000. 
So we probably don't want to always do this by hand when we make our forecast. So how do we do it in Excel? So if we come back to our Excel template and we're in our multiple linear regression tab, we have our summary output. And we know we need those coefficients to make our forecast for our home sales. I like to put my coefficients on the top for my table. So to do that, I can use this transpose function. I can select my coefficients after I've highlighted where I want to put them. And I've hit control shift enter. It'll go ahead and move my coefficients up here. I should label them so I don't forget what they are. And so now I've got my coefficients right along the top. Now, to make my forecast for a home, it's going to be equal to the intercept plus my coefficients times the data value. And then I'm going to add it to the next coefficient times its data value and the next coefficient times its data value. Instead of typing this in by hand, one at a time, I can use the sum product function, which will take the values, which I'm going to lock because those are always going to stay the same, times the data. And we'll go ahead and multiply one by the other and then add them. So it's going to take the sum of the products of the two arrays. So now I've got my forecast and it's exactly 294,000 as we saw when we did it by hand just previously. And we can go ahead and drag this down because we locked all of our coefficient values. right? So in this case it's the coefficient plus 0 0.04 times the 1800, 31.2 times the 1.75, and 25.2 times 0. So we've gone ahead and made our first forecast and so we now can estimate what home one and home two are going to sell for. We covered a lot today, so let's recap what we talked about. We introduced linear regression, right, and the dependent and independent variables. So the dependent is what we're trying to estimate, and we're going to estimate it by saying that the independent variables are influencing it in a causal relationship. We then looked at multiple linear regression where we allowed multiple independent variables. We then looked at all those outputs of the linear regression model. We looked at multiple r, the correlation, r squared, the amount of variation of the dependent variable explained by our independent variables. And then we looked at the adjusted version, which is the more accurate because it accounts for the variable significance. We then looked at the F test. Have we found a significant model, or at least a significant relationship is contained within our model? And then the coefficients. What are the estimated relationships between the independent dependent variable? And finally, which of those coefficients in our model, when we want to select it and we're developing our model, are important? Which ones should we retain in our model? Then we looked at confidence intervals. So what's the range within which our data lies? And finally, we made a forecast. So I look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great day.